think it is important that each of us have a unique journey and therefore a unique challenge that comes by having a unique life that we have to face and process to the point where we have extracted our meaning from that and are able to offer a very unique message and experience from our you know, our life story. And so, uh, yeah, my life story has certainly been a remarkably dramatic, <laughs> dramatic one, colorful one, in the ways that people would naturally call dramatic and, you know, different and, you know, intense. Mm. And so I think I have, a, especially in my community, if not the larger world as well, uh, a duty to really face my own story and be able to really offer the perspective that it's my duty to offer, having gone through that. And uh, yeah, that's, I think that's what we're here to do. So where's like comfortable to start from in terms of you describing your story? Well, uh, I suppose perhaps giving it a nutshell, you know, before going into detail could be helpful. Uh, I was born to parents who were already part of the then called the Hare Krishna movement, uh, which had been planted since the late 60s in America by Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. My parents were uh, initiated by him in the very early 70s, 1971, my mother in 1974, my father. I was born in 1977. So I was born into that burgeoning movement at the time. And I was also raised in an ashram community in West Virginia. You know, the typical pictures that anyone in this modern culture might think of when someone says the word cult might come up. But we have a property out in the woods. <laughs> we moved away from uh, the sort of the counter opinions of a larger culture. Mm. So there's a bit of an isolated space that we lived in. We had our own plumbing. We had our own sewage system. <laughs> we had, you know, many people able to live in shacks and so on because there, was, there wasn't there was as many rules from the outside society coming to bear on how you can build a house and how you can, right? So there's a lot of mm. uh, things that come with being able to have an isolated space with a lot more independence to live that whatever your alternative lifestyle may be. And uh, we had in there what you could compare to a modern idea of a boarding school. So we call it, call it an ashram or a gurukula. And what does that mean, gurukula? Well, it, what it came to mean essentially is just a school where the kids lived in the school away from the parents. And so we had a separate set of teachers that we lived in a room with. And then during the day, we may have different teachers like that teach us our academic subjects and so on. Mm. But essentially, we lived in the school in a separate property or home or something like that. Uh, the concept that that's founded on is a traditional concept. So Kula, right, is like family and Guru, just, uh, you know, is a word for teacher, essentially. So the tradition was that uh, one would go live wherever the guru was that you wanted to study from. So there may be ashrams, and generally an ashram would be in some place that was a little bit remote so that there's more focus. And uh, some people had tuition money to pay, and some people didn't. And so the way a guru's home or kula family would work is, you know, some people would pay money, some people would go out and beg daily and bring whatever they, they could, but everybody uh, with whatever monetary means they had and with menial service, like someone's going to do the sweeping, someone's going to feed the cows, someone's going to clean the barn, someone's going to chop the veggies, you know, uh, everyone lived together in the guru's mm. home and everyone studied together in that way. And the theory of education goes to the deeper roots of Vedic culture and the theory of education and how knowledge is cultivated and transmitted 
is in this field that's created where there's a safety, a respect, and a trust that is created by this guru in that home where there's mm. healthy, safe, personal relationships happening. Right. And knowledge is more about cultivating that space. And that's what's being engendered into the students. And then the information that's put in there is cultured within that environment. And that's the theory of education in essence. Mm. And it's symbolized by the junior or the student touching the feet of the senior or the guru. Mm. And that symbolizes that whole relationship, that whole culture of education and knowledge. So that was the idea behind it. Mm. And here, basically, we were raised in this attempt, you know, in some way or another being inspired by this ancient tradition. Right. And so I grew up in that, in this attempt. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So, you, you, and you describe it as this was an attempt of that. So what do you mean by that? Well, that's, you can say, to understand anything in the Vedic perspective, we seek to understand what are the two opposites in the subject matter we're dealing with. So the attempt here I, I've described, what's the ideal that's uh, mm. inspiring this on one side, right. and then here's the modern situation where these, you know, Hare Krishna people were trying to uh, do this. And the other side, you could say, of that ideal, you could say is the dark, you know, failure or the worst things that modern culture has sort of brought to the table. Mm. <laughs> and so we suffered all, um, all types of atrocities. One could think a child should never suffer, you know, in terms of physical abuse, in terms of strange mental uh, warping, mental abuse, in, t in terms of very intensive uh, emotional uh, you know, violence, pushing a child's capacity to hold different emotional states to places that we just had no capacity to hold. Mm. Uh, sexual abuse was rampant in terms of the teachers, you know, uh, sexually engaging in all types of ways, physical and others with the kids, and then the kids with the kids. Right? Uh, the physical abuse was, wow, it was over the top rampant. I mean, most of us who have gone there, have physical scars, noses were broken, arms were broken, what to speak of the day in, day out uh, normalcy of things, which to, you know, most of us might think, even if it happened once, would be, you know, like, like smacking a small child. We're talking about kids between the ages of, for, for example, four yeah. to 12. And if I were to take like a five-year-old kid in front of me, and slap them so hard that they slammed into the ground mm. and were yelping like a dog, like with a high pitched sound and then keep hitting them. This was a daily occurrence. Picking up the little kid who wasn't standing in line straight by their ear and yanking them back into the line. Uh, these were constant every mm. day is what to speak of those more intense things I mentioned. Mm, mm. Whipping to the point of blood and lifelong scarring you told me once about how you and the other kids would have to go pick out the particular stick or yeah yeah so I, i've heard i mean i all i knew was gurukul i didn't know what this outside modern world really was at all and but later on i've heard from others that this was a common practice in catholic schools uh -huh. <laughs> so it's very interesting that you know, the modern people brought some of their modern baggage, you can say, we call it vesh, you know, the dress sort of externalities yeah. and, and it mixed. So, yeah, we used to go on walks through the woods where we lived, for example, and the, some of the trees and, and the teacher instructed us. And it's, you know, as children, we're generally very uh, without guile and, with, you know, without suspicion and and there's just an innocence that you know we want to please the elder mm. and so he showed us which switches work really good and they have to make this this whipping sound 
in the air. The teacher would tell you all this. Yeah, yeah, what to look for. And so we would all, you know, compete to try to get the best switches. They're called switches, right? To mm. whip us with when we get out of line. And so, uh, yeah, and, and this is, you know, part of our walks through the woods on some of our leisure time. Oh, my God. So while we're going for some leisure walk, we're picking switches. You're also to trying get, to find. For us to get beaten with later. So oh and, and for us as innocent children, this was all we knew. This was all I knew. And so this was life. So to really understand the situation, we kind of need to picture that, that it's mm. not that I had some comparison. Some of the other kids mm. may mm. have and did. You know, for instance, my sister, you know, she they came to had the a memory call. of public school. Mm. And so there was something to compare to. Myself, this was all I knew. So what what, what years did you go to Girl Call? Um, seven, 80, when I was three years old was my first right. like actually going into the group and mm. I was so eager because my elder brother and my elder sister I was the third out of four and uh, I was so excited to go to group with the big kids that when I was three I was the youngest that uh, later on when you know we were telling stories to lawyers and whatever it was uh, I was the youngest to have gone to group because I was so eager to go with the big kids that I uh, basically tricked the guy who drove the community bus that drove up and down in our community to take me to Gurukul, had my little backpack. And, <laughs> yeah, my mom, my Mata told me, you know, Mata, mother, my told me, you know, I can go to Gurukul. So I ended up going there. And uh, boy, it was a shocking, sudden awakening, even from the first day uh, of, of Gurukul. In what way? We woke up in the, we wake up uh, in the morning, every morning, Three three thirty for the morning uh, function, Mangala Arati, right in the Brahma Muhurta, the time before the sun rises, hour and a half, and yoga kli, the cold shower is part of the routine and so on. And right, so you know, there's there's very beautiful, amazing traditions that inspire all this, and it's just interesting how you know they they mixed in this initial uh, experiment attempt. Mm. So. The kids were all basically forced to take cold showers, whether it was comfortable or not, and so on, and, and get up in uh, 3, 3.30 in the morning. And so my brother, uh, I was in his ashram room, and he didn't wake up very easily. He, was, well, he wasn't like the morning type of guy. So this is your first day? First day, first day. And, and so in the morning, all of us had, you know, gotten up and people were showering and so on. And he was, you know, languishing in his bed, not wanting to get up and, and kind of still sleep, really. And it came to a point where basically everyone else had showered. Uh, uh, and I remember the teacher coming and throwing, uh, there was some water in a bucket, like a five-gallon bucket, and there was some water in it. And threw it on him in while on his sleeping bag while he was still in the bed. And uh, the shock of it woke him up so suddenly uh, he literally sprung out of bed with the shock of the cold water and ran into the wall and slammed his face into the wall and then fell on the ground, you know, be bewildered, in pain, and then oh everybody laughing at him with the teacher leading the pointing fingers and laughing at him. And this was my older brother, mm. you know, my hero mm. that I had come to grow up looking up to. And so this was a defining beginning moment, basically my initiation into Guru. You know, this is what mm. the Guru Kul story is about here. So already from day one, there was shame, humiliation. And lack of safe. This was not only not. was this is not safe. This is a place mm. where, you know, physical harm is allowed and normal. Here. It's just normal. Disrespect is mm. allowed and normal. And even the teacher was pointing his finger and encouraging everyone else to join him in taunting, you know, my younger brother, I mean, my older brother. And so, if you know, and so this was the story that mm. this was going to be. So I, right away... 
there was something in me that just you know seized up and froze that mm. oh my god this is not the fantasy the dream that yeah. I had, you know <laughs> tricked the bus driver to bring me to <laughs> I was so excited to join in <laughs> right wow so then like that's your first day obviously you've given us a bit of a glimpse of okay what generally you know how things were so you were from you were at Gurukul from three till until I was 12 12 so somewhere between thing. 11 and 12 yeah that's that's a long time I mean to be you know experiencing yeah. all that you did so you talked about the abuse and that that was daily for yeah. all of those years yeah there was basically you can say the things that were quite trivial and normal to us were things such as ear pulling, shoving, pushing, slapping, uh, you know, things like slapping upside the head or sometimes even a smack across the face. And, and then, and th this isn't necessarily punishment. This is just how we're handled kind of mm. thing. So there was basically a, a certain amount of, you know, violence or roughness or disrespect and so on. That was part of the norm. Like right. this was not like orange or red levels. So this is just like standing in line for lunch or, it, you know, you get a near pulling to, if you're just out of line or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, anything trivial, basically, you know, some type of physical correcting. Yeah, like the, the, the throwing of the water and then the laughing and humiliation just yeah, by waking that's, up. That's, yeah, that's even just that's you know, just taunting and, you know, shaming and you know, whatever, but like the actual... Getting, I could get smacked across the face till I heard ringing in my ears at any time. That that could just be normal. Right. I could suddenly just have someone jerk my ear with my whole body weight to hmm. make me move somewhere from behind, and I don't even know what's going on. And how many teachers were doing this? This was normal. This was the culture of the school. This is the way things were operated. Mm. It was just. And how, but how many teachers were there? Um, I guess I would estimate um, somewhere around like a dozen for the boys and probably around the same for the girls. I, That's I've, a lot. I've seen numbers at the t uh, somewhere from uh, there was something like through the years. Yeah. That, and, and that was mainly through that decade from you can say 75 or so to 80, you know, 88 that it was really in its kind of heyday. Something around uh, within uh, 500 kids sort of breathed through that miracle system. So some of us, you know, were there through the whole thing. Some there was 500 sort of kids. Yeah. When I've heard, you know, your stories before, I'm thinking of maybe like 50 kids. No, I'd say there was probably like, you know, maybe, a, I don't know, 100, 150, maybe at a time. At least yeah so at a time but then the right families and come and go some, yeah exactly there's some amount of circulation that's so that, many kids that i've ex that would have experienced this that's yeah. that's that we were one group cool, so there was you know, yeah group cool in yeah and Brindavan, you know bengal texas you know a few places mm. had such but we were one of the biggest in the world certainly in america yeah. at the time so yeah. one of the I mean, one of the special things about New Vrindavan, we'll get to in a moment, why New Vrindavan was um, unique in all of the Gurukuls, I think, according to, you know, the stories and we'll get to, but just in terms of the abuse, you've mentioned, you know, about the, that you had to pick your own whip and obviously this is really traumatizing to, to listen to, so this is kind of like a trigger warning for anyone listening, but you also mentioned like a kid's court, so. Mm. This was, uh, well kids, I mean, there was many different things that happened through the years. Okay. This was one interesting episode. So basically this is the third headmaster that had come into uh, power there. And so Sri Galim was the previous headmaster and you know, he had molested kids, he'd beaten kids, he'd, but he also instituted the culture of, you know, a decade at least, I think he was in power there, where he had instituted the constant 
multi-leveled abuse with full range right. going on. And then uh, he was basically uh, stepped aside and played still a supporting sort of side role. Whereas Chakravarti, uh, who is a German uh, disciple of Shiva Prabhupada, came in uh, to Nirvana mm. and he became the new headmaster. Okay. And so he instituted this thing called Kids Court as mm. part of his regime. So his reforms, his system that he brought in. So he had this Kids Court thing and uh, the Kids Court consisted of a few, a panel, you know, some, some group of him and some teachers that would you know, consider what the kid had done, sort of, and decide what the, you know, punishments would be. Mm -hmm. So, the first memory I have of kids' court, specifically, was that uh, my brother, Ramanuja. Um, older brother. Yeah, older brother Ramanuja had passed away. You know, my younger brother had already passed away some years prior. Uh, which is another story which we'll get to. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so my elder brother, Ramanuja, he had been in India, in Vrindavan, Gurukul. Mm -hmm. So he had returned, which I was really excited about. I always looked up to my elder brother, obviously, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and, yeah, he came back very changed, very rough, very dark, you know, uh, withdrawn. I remember he, he started always crossing his arms and sort of a crease in his face most of the time, didn't talk to, you know, people much anymore, and told me I was stupid, you know, thinking that, because I was always excited to be able to go to Vrindavan. When kids got 10, basically, it was like we would go to Vrindavan right. in Something. India, and I was, like, so excited about this. Mm. And I remember, uh, you know, one of the things that I picked up on when I was quite young was that, you know, Brahmi oil, which is like a traditional oil we put in our hair uh -huh. it's an ayurvedic oil for okay. hair, brahmi oil so it goes in the brahma spot mm. in your head the mm. middle of the head uh and it's supposed to help your memory but it's all supposed to be, it could make my sika grow faster okay. <laughs> and i was so proud of my so you wanted longest, longer i had hair. the longest sika in the right, like, oh, right, right. Morning, you know, so i was telling my brother you gotta bring me back some brahmi oil <laughs> 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 so this is part of my like sort of puppy dog sort of finding yeah. my elder brother and when he mm. came back and I was asking he, he just told me I remember you're so stupid you think going to India is fun and you think it's bad here it's 10 times worse there oh my god you have no idea what you're what you're even talking about oh. you know but I was so I was just this sort of innocent foolish naive puppy dog right and he had just you know come back from there yeah so, and grown and up real fast to, you know, at the time, we, 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 at that time, lived in a building which was adjacent from the main temple building. And the place where we went for our daily academic studies was a couple miles walk, hmm. um, you know, down through a dirt road and so hmm. on. So we would walk there every day and so on. There was always some dogs or cats or both, but there was always a dog that, you know, they seemed to just... You know, another one just seemed to mm -hmm. somehow <laughs> roll into town after the other one passed away somehow. Mm. Anyways, uh, there was some puppies from one of these dogs right. that was there at the time. And uh, this other boy and my brother, uh, I'll not mention his name because I don't know if he wants to be you mm -hmm. know, here, but uh, they picked up this puppy dog and it seemed to be sick. Right. So they brought it up to down in the valley where we would go for academic studies. There was one barn that was being used for like shop class, mm -hmm. you know, how to cut wood and you okay. know, nail stuff and construction type of work they were getting us into. And so they they found a little corner inside of there to, you know, put a little place for the dog and, and feed him leftover scraps that they would save. Right. So, but the dog got worse and eventually died. Uh huh. And so it was discovered by one of the teachers right. that they had kept this puppy and that it had, and it had died. So the way they framed the story mm. was that they killed this dog. Oh gosh! And they were how old? The kids? My brother would have been uh, ten, eleven. Okay, so if, yeah, really young. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would have been oh, seven, no. eight. Right, and and the other boy would have been. He was in my ashram. He was my age. Right. 
And so, uh, so one was eight, one was 10 years. Yeah, yeah, super there. young, yeah. So the teachers came in there and basically made the story that they had killed this dog. And so now they had, right, uh, this bad karma uh -huh. that they had now incurred by killing this dog. And so kids court decided that they should be punished accordingly to clean them and expunge them of this bad karma. So the, the way it's philosophically framed is we're doing you a favor oh, my God. by punishing you in such a way that it cleans you from the karma that you've incurred by, you know, killing the dog. So because this comes from, again, it's all these, we have these beautiful traditions with yeah. these, you know, stories. So of the how, philosophy is there of karma, but then how it's been used and yeah. twisted to justify their wrong actions yeah. Yeah. is just all, yeah, awful. Because they're basically the proprietors of how these philosophical ideas and these traditional stories will yeah. be translated into, you know, our learning. <laughs> So God. they were basically sentenced by the kids' court, by Chakravarti et al., the, these other teachers, to be treated like dogs. By They would get, they got tied up oh. by their necks uh, to the bunk beds and, yeah. the, and the rooms that we lived in. And it was encouraged that everybody should, uh, you know, taunt them, humiliate them, and rebuke them, and treat them badly so that they could be cleansed of this karma, oh, the, this God. bad dog karma. Oh my God. So by them enduring this, they would be cleaned, cleansed of this karma. So, and so the teachers, of course, they would model this and lead the way with everybody else following them. So, that, you know, Godia was a, a, one of the teachers and he was mm -hmm. probably the most notorious, like everyone had their sort of MO, style. Like, yeah, their style. Oh my yes, God, style of abuse. Of abuse. Yes. Oh. So Godia was more physically abusive. Okay. He was a bit. He he had a bit. He was bigger and stronger and and you know, like this. And so he would go and like you know incur throw buckets of water, smack like th you know make force them to. They were also right. Yeah, they were forced to eat their food oh. like dogs without oh, their hands. No. They would have to eat like with their face into oh, the plate no. and so on. And you know, of course, everyone's taunting them and making fun of them you know, to do this. And uh, so they had, I can't remember the span of time, but it was days or I don't know, a week or whatever it was, something in that neighborhood that they mm. had to go through this. Oh. And so there was a lot of beating involved because they were basically in this helpless position and they yeah. should be treated this way. And so this was my first, yeah. you know, concrete memory of kids court. Right. And so this can, through that, you can understand what kids court meant the types of things that they they could do right and so after kids court was that that particular story was done my brother uh didn't like godia very much right he, he, he had enough. a particular hate for godia because godia really was the one who really just i right, pushed that Cruel. punishment and you know prodded him the most okay and so he he really uh, my brother really felt particularly, you know, ill disposed, angry, and you know, so on naturally towards yeah. Godia. So, and, and Godia, I think, probably towards him had this, you know. So one day before, uh, well, Mangalarti, our morning right worship services in the, yeah. the, the in the temple room was going on. Mm -hmm. My brother wasn't there yet. He was. And so the the whole ashram side, uh, there's two buildings adjacent to each other, and so our ashram was in one building on the bottom, which is now their uh, guest house where they have like a hotel to house people when they visit. And so you know the lights are out, everybody's gone, everyone's in the temple room chanting and dancing and music and the whole thing. So my brother was basically just mulling around in the dark there by himself, and there was a, a little snack bar that was closed at the time, obviously, but they had like a little, some kind of snack things that were sugar, right? Sugar shakers mm -hmm. that would sit on the tables. Oh, the okay. Snack bar. So my brother was just, you know, eating a little sugar, licking a little sugar off his hands kind uh -huh. of a thing. And so Godia comes through and sees my brother. Oh. 
you know, he's not, what are you doing He's here? not in the temple. Yeah, he's... what are you doing here? And, and they would call him Ghost. Because Your brother. Because I mentioned how he would kind of, since he came back from Gurukul, you know, whatever he went through there, he started keeping to himself. He became was... like a withdrawn kind yeah. of character. Yeah, yeah. There was a couple of them, my brother and this other kid, who became the most... So they called him Ghost. Who called him Ghost? The, the teachers. teachers. And, and, you know, the and kids, other kids then. who wanted to use that. Oh, so, God. yeah, what are you doing here, you know, ghost or whatever like this, taunting him. And so my brother basically, he told me, he just told him to, you know, leave me alone. Mm. And started, you know, basically just walking away from him. And, and of course, Godia comes in, like, grabs him by the neck. And, uh, you know, who, you, who do you think you are talking to be like this? And basically what ensued there is Godia just beat, literally beat him with his fit, like oh. punched him out and broke his nose. Oh my gosh. So since that time, my brother's nose was off to the side because he had broken it so badly. Oh. So this is what, you know, this is a one story out of each of us kids will tell you, and this is one story from me, one person, I can go on telling you many, yeah, many, we could be here for... and all these kids could tell you many of these stories. Right. And the thing is, even me telling this story now, who among, you know, you know, have you, and who among the people that might listen to this have ever seen a child struck like this? <sighs> with It's one thing to even uh, reprimand a child you know, with force, with restraint, actually mm -hmm. with intention that, you know, I need to correct this child. Mm -hmm. But there's a, a pain yeah. to do that. Even that can be painful if right. you've seen it or if you've had to do yeah. it. Now, when I don't have any kind of remorse or not only that, but on top, I have this abandon of, you know, will to be violent and hurtful, knowing that there's nobody to stop me and I want to do this. I mean, it's just evil. So what I'm getting to is, you know, to be, to, to understand mm. what this is. Mm. We need, you know, if you've never seen it, you need to actually stop and think about it for a moment. Yeah. What this means to have, a, you know, a small, you know, defenseless, innocent child like this and, and have them being beaten with such violence. And, and what are the levels? There's a physical violence for one thing. Yeah. But then, the, you know, so the nervous system will always know that, you know, I'm not safe. Yeah. yeah. So the, the body will always be, you know, constricted and tight and, you know, very vigilant. But what about the emotions as well? That mm. if the very people who are the sources of my safety and respect and love and mm. warmth are the sources of this, the meaning of each of those, mm. so, you know, and this is what people need to understand is by stopping and thinking about this, feel for a moment, yeah. not just for these particular kids. But what this does to community mm. and society mm. for generations, and it's this is what a lot mm. of people in these communities is come for sure, mm. but at large don't understand. Right. That happened in the past. They say. Yeah. You guys just get need to move, it. get yeah. over and move on, and and also they think. But mm. they didn't have anything to do it, so it doesn't affect me. Mm -hmm. It's no longer a relevant, important topic. Right. Now, what they don't understand is these things are living still in the culture. Yeah. Until and unless these things are actually faced, mm -hmm. processed. Yeah. Right. Thought about what does this mean to yeah. us, and the action is taken to address that. Yeah, and bring it back to what do what are our values? Not yeah. what we think they should be. What are what's important to us in our lives as a community, as a family, right? Mm. And things are readjusted. Mm. And until then, what's happened is the culture has become a culture with those values. And who are the people that will come into that fold? Mm. Who are the people that will stay in that fold? Right. And how will that community continue to develop 
is around in that though, way it yeah. literally will be with those things in the center right not the only things in the center perhaps yeah. but right because now in iskon and has been since you were in gurukul there's a there's a there, there's a label that comes with being a gurukuli mm -hmm. somebody who went to gurukul mm -hmm. right that they have chips on their shoulders they they're a nuisance they're just party goers or like but but i mean they've had to contend with all of this maybe not to the, the, this extreme because different yeah. gurukuls of you know around the world have had different degrees of abuse but abuse is abuse and and you know how do we how do we deal with trauma if we don't get the right support we either implode or we explode right yeah. it's like either you escape right because you can't face the pain so many guru coolies have turned to drugs various types of addictions they've left the spiritual movement so they have they're, aversion to have aversion anything to, to anything spiritual any type of meditation especially to do with krishna yeah or Prabhupada or history. yeah and all due to these you know really psychopathic evil individuals taking something yeah. pure and and twisting it using it as you know so what they can feel in power by by abusing these innocent kids right. and these innocent kids grow up with these traumas unresolved traumas and then they get labeled by the whole community as being a nuisance to the society it's like how and it's interesting to look at that relationship so on one hand those people who can participate in that labeling yeah of, most often unconscious in the sense that i'm not you know as a, such a person in the community of a temple somewhere in you know the world in iskon may not be thinking let me now you know take upon me in my mind mm. this unconscious labeling uh, of you know some pejorative negative emotion and, and put it onto these guys mm. but it's a it's a unconscious mechanism that can mm. happen but who but people who would be vulnerable to engaging in that who mm. don't have in place right a strong enough intelligence or understanding or moral standing mm. to not accept that yeah who but those type of people could come into this kind and function in this kind and therefore yeah. become part of that culture which holds hidden in its heart mm -hmm. these things in place. Right, right. So for each of these people who are in, you know, this ISKCON Krishna community, but who are also in other communities, I hope that some of what we're talking about can just help us all to examine, you know, some of yeah. the things that we all fall into. Yeah. Of unconsciously uh, blaming victims or, or in any way, putting unconscious pejorative put down sort of labels on people without really yeah. coming to that conclusion ourselves based on mm. the knowledge of the mm. people. Yeah, I think that this is why it's so important that we're talking about this, because I think also a large part of what has happened and still is happening is the cover up and hiding of the abuse because of for, to, to not, you know, whatever, ruin the reputation, reputation of Iskon or ruin the reputation of the founder, Srila Prabhupada. Um, but in that hiding and in that denial comes further abuse. Yeah. <laughs> because to not listen to the victims of abuse who are your very children of the society yeah. is just so damaging. So it's like, you wanna save the mask, you wanna save the, the cover, right mm -hmm. but inside it's rotting mm -hmm. how is that any service to the founder how is that any service to shalom about anything yeah. yeah it's quite ironic i mean even in the shima bhagavatam there's a, a famous allegorical right uh, example mm -hmm. given of a of this queen who has a oh a, a bird and you know provides this bird as a queen can a golden cage yeah <laughs> which is very you know nicely polished and shined and so on and so on and so much attention and great, given to wonderful, the cage. you know, such a wonderful cage. Right. And meanwhile, the bird is dying. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so yeah. it's so ironic how this can we can we can find ourselves engaged in what we would consider consciously yeah. abominable, reprehensible acts. Yeah. Unbeknownst to us, and that sometimes you know, it gets to the point where we don't even want to look at that. Yeah. Because just to and this is so much of this happens right below our like the actual conversations we have with ourselves or each other. Mm. If I were to look in this direction, I sense this is way more than I can deal with. Mm. I already have to like, you know, whatever people have to do, we have to have a job and, you know, just maintain our mm -hmm. lives. And that's enough for, you yeah. know, for anybody. Yeah. To, you know? And then the, if I even look over here, it's going to be too much. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's an abnegation of the responsibility of my role in a community that can mm. happen in this way. Mm, mm. And before we know it, we're implicit in this machine of right. spiritual levels, social levels, and physical levels of violence, abuse, and the, the, the very things we thought we were going in, you know, away from and towards this beautiful spiritual wonderland. Right. So can we go circle back to kids court? So what was your experience of kids court? Yeah. Is that okay to talk about yeah. on the weekend? Yeah. So it was not so long after that episode that we related earlier. Mm. Uh, I was perhaps a year elder at that point. And there was my teacher's name at the time was Jiva Goswami. Mm -hmm. He was part of, there was three teachers that all showed up together. I heard later they were all like homosexual lovers or something together. They, they right. all came from, uh, they were French Canadians. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which temple, maybe Toronto temple they had come from. Mm -hmm. And so I had already, there was Garunga, mm. who was my Gurukul teacher when they first showed up. And then there was Ananta, who became my Gurukul teacher after him. Mm. And then there was Jiva Goswami, who was my Gurukul teacher at this time. You know, all of them were, uh, you know, highly physically violent, you know, all kinds of weird mental stuff and mm. also sexually abusive, you know, like literally we're talking everything, you know, full on having sex with the, with us kids and everything. Uh, Jiva Goswami at the time, um, I was in his ashram, which was not the building that was adjacent from the temple. So we are ashram. Uh, we were like, you know, nine year olds coming on 10 kind of eight, nine, somewhere around there. So we were down uh, in this smaller building. They had, you know, we called it, you know, Frasier's. This is a little, mm -hmm. you know, property they bought from someone named Frasier. Oh, okay. So it was adjacent. So it was, you know, maybe a 20 minute walk or so, you know, down a hill sort of through the, you know. So um, mm. when we were walking, we all had our japa, our beads that we would chant mantra on in the morning, our japa mm. beads. And, so I had a backpack that my mother had given me and uh, I would carry the japa beads for the, our ashram. Okay. So uh, basically, um, I remember I'll start the story that one day this other teacher, um, what was her name? She was also a Canadian. Uh, anyway, she was a friend, Dina Sharn. She was a friend of my mother's. And I didn't know her, but she was friendly with my mother, so I just knew who she was. And there mm. was some type of, because she was connected to my mother, mm. some type of warm sort of uh, recognition mm -hmm. there. My teacher, Jiva Goswami, caught on to this and used that as a means of shaming me. Every time we would go by there, you know, oh, that's your, your friend. <laughs> as if this was some point of some, ridicule. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, she was watching over these younger kids who are quite young, maybe four years old and, and some of them would like for example one time we went by and some kid had you know defecated on the ground like you know literally passed stool in the middle of the floor there kind of mm. thing because he didn't run to the bathroom and time right. whatever it was so then he taunted me to go oh that's your friend why don't you go and help her uh -huh. you know it's your friend right and uh, of course i'm just you know awkwardly stiff and like just hoping yeah. this is gonna you know and then 
each time we would go by her and there was some situation like that, he would do this, you know, goading and shaming. And so he would like even push me this one time when the kid had shot in the floor, he like started pushing me there, like trying to actually push this, like I should go help and wow. so on. And, so... and, you know, for a young child, as I was, it was, it was actually confusing. Right. Should I, like, I actually think uh... these things. See, we, it's, Right, it's, it's easy to gloss over these things when it's just a passing store, but if we stop... There's something moment, actually going on in you as a kid, oh like, yeah. in your mind. Yeah, it's different to be a child in some of these scenarios. Yeah. Because our minds are not adult minds yet. Yeah. So I'm literally thinking, like, is it... You know, and I felt bad. Mm. Maybe I am bad. I, I, am I? Mm. But then my body was seized up. I felt, you know, really indignant and like ashamed and confused and i was a you know difficult internal yeah. sort of emotional situation while he was also on the outside shaming me and i felt pissed i was like a lot of it was confusing yeah it was tough so he did this a few times and then one time it came to a head mm. and this is a lot of things i mean i was basically it was at age when we some of us were just getting fed up Right. After a lifetime of abuse, and I knew nothing else, so I didn't know there was anything else but this. But it, there's something just objectively true <laughs> that we all, without language, we just know. Mm. You know, in terms of safety, respect, and right. care, these are the three kind of layers I words I use. And so I, uh, one day, same thing, going by her ashram, some kid was serving the food and breakfast time. And spilled over a bucket of some food. Mm -hmm. We had oat water and rice, one of our main breakfast foods, you know. So the oat water, you know, <laughs> some of the kids were like, Whew. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God that oat water got spilled away. <laughs> so, oh God. and of course my teacher, you know, and we were all basically already, the, us kids in the ashram, mm. w sitting on the side waiting to go out the door, you know. Mm. And, uh, you know, they, everyone puts their bead bags in my backpack and you know, okay. whatever. And so he's, but of course he comes by and he's like, oh, it's your friend. Why don't you go, you know, help and, and this and that. God, and I, and, and so what did I, and, and here's, uh, this was a big line for me to cross. Uh -huh. I said, leave me alone. I mean, you know, I've seen these like, you know, <laughs> cereals from India. Bollywood. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's these moments where someone says a line and they, you know, in order to convey the, the impact of yeah. what was just said, they'll zoom in and out really fast and have some sound effects. And it was like it this was type like of a moment. For me to be able to, to, to say, like, actually have words come out of my mouth that in any way were an affront to my teacher's position of absolute authority was very risky. Because this could, you know, just make me uh, you know, more mm. so than it already was. Was an, an object a target. Of, yeah, abuse, you know, of, you know, literally just physical and whatever, all of it. So, but I, it was just like welling up in me. Mm. And so, I, you know, leave me alone. And that, and it was just such a big deal. And then, so, but then, he, and then he, of course, caught right onto that. And then he started grabbing me by the arm and sort of, you know, bringing me to it. And, and then he goes and picks up the mop. Mm. and shoves it like shoves it in my chest mm. you know like this to try to force me to take it and i wouldn't take it and he's shoving it into me you know and uh that point i grabbed the the handle of the mop and he then pushed me to the ground and he started rubbing my face in the oat water oh while I was holding oh the mop God. in my hand. And as soon as he like somewhat, like he didn't have as tight of a hold on me, I, you know, threw him off. I threw the mop down and I said, and I, and I said, you're an ass. Oh. And I said it out loud. And like, that was the best cuss word I could, you know, I didn't know cuss, cussing. <laughs> that was my first successful oh. cuss, you know? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, the, the first leave me alone was... That was enough. But this that was just yeah, that was I, I oh, basically broke that's it. That was and that you was broken. Gone. There was something at that moment right. I, I made it a very important choice for my life. Right, 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 right. Point. That's interesting though. Yeah. yeah. And I said 
you're an ass and I'll never forget it. Just to the, it's echoing in me to this day, right. you know, I, and because it wasn't worth it to me anymore. Mm. The, you know, the, the constant protecting myself and yeah, living in yeah. fear. I'd, I'd rather call him an ass right. and have, the, and have your dignity. Yeah. The freedom and the pleasure is, you know, some wow. kind of pleasure yeah. I couldn't understand. Yeah. <laughs> Just by being I have, yeah. yourself and yeah. I've got my dignity and yeah. it doesn't matter what I go through. Wow. And so, yeah, basically he, I can't remember what exactly what he did, but it, it basically he said, you know, there's a, there's going to be some serious punishment and so on and so on. And, and so what he did is he said, you know, you stay here and, and until this is cleaned up, you know, and then, you know, and I'll see you later kind of a thing, you know? So I had the backpack with the junk beads and I can't remember who, but one other boy stayed back with me a little while. Mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. to like console me a little bit. Right. And, um, I, I start, I sat there brooding for a little while and I decided, I made a choice. I started coming up with this plan, mm. you know, that uh, I'm going to, I'm going to run away. Right. And I, I remember putting this plan together. I remember some of the traditional stories that we were taught mm. and I remember in some of the dramas when someone went traveling, mm -hmm. they had this stick and they would have like a bag, like a cloth oh, bag yeah. tied on the end yeah, of the stick. Yeah, it's like a typical kind of... When you go traveling, that's how Yeah, you put snacks stick. in the bag and, and, and stick. And so I was like, okay, I have this backpack, <laughs> so I should get, you know, it's like, what do I do? I should have this backpack and, and you know, get this something to survive in my backpack. And so I, I took out all the bead bags, set them somewhere, and, you know, and it was like this... You know, I just didn't even have any intelligence or training. I just, it was very instinctual that I, mm. I just wanted to, I, I, this line had been broken. And now I was, you know, on this other side of something. Mm. And I, I left, I ran away. Uh, and basically for the next two weeks or three weeks, I managed to stay uh, away from all of those authorities Mm. I would steal food from after people had eaten, get the left, find the leftovers. I would sleep in a band. We had an abandoned school bus that was parked you know, mm -hmm. off to the side of the temple area. I slept in that sometimes. I slept in just little abandoned places where I could find, a, you know, some blanket. So you're still in the temple ground. The, the New Vrindavan area is it's very huge. large. It's, right. it was, at that time, it was 5,000 acres. It's very large area yeah. so it's almost it's basically a town you know some town limits are not that big <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah i ran away for two weeks and just to fast forward everything when i was finally caught uh by the then temple commander mm. and they uh, brought me back to the gurukul authorities i was brought to kids court right and you know they brought me in front of kids court and you know I went through the interrogation and whatever, whatever. And then they heard whatever I had to say and then sentenced me with my, you know, punishment. So they brought me in front of the kids court and, you know, here's the charges that have been, you know, lodged against you kind of thing. So on right. and so on. And you, you ran away, you talked back to your teacher, you called him a name, like all the yeah. other stuff. And we've talked to, to, all right. So now then they ask me, why did you, you know, run away? What do you have to say for yourself? Kind of a thing. And, uh, you know, of course I didn't have a lawyer representing me. <laughs> no. How <laughs> was, old were you? Uh, I was like a court of an attorney. You know? <laughs> how old were you? <laughs> I was eight or nine. Right. Yeah. Oh my God. So I didn't know, I didn't have language to say what I had to say. Uh, but somehow... I had some amount of courage and dignity, I believe, mm. you know, modeled to me by my father, mm. you know, uh, who had been murdered. But well, nonetheless, he, we'll was get to someone, that. Yeah, <laughs> he was someone who was uh, right. courageous and stood yeah. up for himself, He, you know, and so on. Mm. Anyways, I answered honestly to the best of my ability. 
I, I you know, I said that um, that my teacher basically mistreats me, but I also said he does these things to me, mm. and I don't like it. Uh -huh. And he, you know, he touches me and he does things to me, and I didn't even know what to say, like yeah. how to call it. Yeah. Uh, but I don't like it. Mm. Wow. And so, you know, and, and that's why. Mm -hmm. And so immediately, suddenly, very quickly, they, they stopped the, you know, me speaking mm -hmm. part of this meeting. Right. And said they were going to confer amongst themselves. And so they had me brought out of the room. They conferred amongst themselves for some time, for a while. I remember I was waiting for some time. And then brought me back in and told me that, uh, they had spoken to Jiva Goswami, my teacher, mm -hmm. and I had been a problem for some time. Oh, right, conveniently. And I was always a problem. Mm. And so he didn't want, to, and we, we tried to convince him to take you back and, you know, that you would be on better behavior and so on, but he didn't want to deal with you. You're too much trouble. So we're putting you into this other ashram, uh, Dwarpadish's ashram. So Dwarpadish, you know, everyone had their you know, abuse style. Okay. So he was the former army sergeant. Oh, uh, great. With one of his, his pointer finger was cut off, uh -huh. you know, in some accident. And so that gave him a particular, you know, sort of mystique. Of... This is insane. <laughs> but you, like, yeah. this sounds like a story made up, like, yeah. like a horror movie. This is where horror movies come from. Yeah. In so. These, these situations. So basically, he, his ashram was seen as you know it was a punishment to be in his ashram right and okay. he was therefore okay. given a bit of a encouraged okay. position to meet out more right oh god you know punishing lifestyle in that ashram so yeah. it was kind of like going to jail ashram as if it wasn't already you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so i was basically that was one of my things yeah uh, another one was that so my mother she um, yeah, where is your mom? In, 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 yeah. Well, that's a whole. Yeah. You know, each part of this is quite a. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, it's such avenues. an alien lifestyle. Yeah, from yeah. Anybody. Yeah. There is no normal to this. Well, these teachers were trusted by these parents. Okay. Yeah. So uh, my mother was with this guy named Gopan Ganapati. Mm -hmm. Right, well, they pronounced it Ganapati. Yeah, <laughs> American. <laughs> So he was, uh, he was from Canada as well. There's a lot of Canadian guys in there. So anyways, uh, he worked in the molding shop and they, so the, the, you know, Grihastas, some of them got like a stipend, a little bit of, you know, 50 bucks, you know, a month or something, some mm. small amount of money they would get mm. because they were, you know, attached to, you know, sex life. And so they, they, they lived sort of as lower class people. Mm that, you know, would get some money because mm. they weren't totally devoted. Mm. So anyways, he was one of the guys that would do that. And so he got a little money and he paid uh, some, saved up some money and paid for me to have a mridanga. Uh -huh. it a, and it was a, so they started making these mridangas in New Vrindavan. Mridangas, you know, people don't know it's the drum that we play. Yeah, yeah. A small head on one. And so, Looks like a tabla, but it's all together. Yeah, and one. so... They've had a shop there, mm -hmm. uh, a molding shop, where, amongst other things, they uh, had fiberglass mm -hmm. molding. Yeah. And so they figured out how to make these drums out of fiberglass, fiberglass. instead of the yeah, having clay. to get them from India, made from by hand and everything from clay. So, and this one was a, a kid-sized one, so they mm -hmm. started making kid-sized ones. And it was like the body was fiberglass, so they would mix glitter into mm -hmm. the fiberglass to make it shine, you know, and it yeah. was a gold color. Uh -huh. So it was a glittering gold madunga, and I got yeah. it for my birthday. Uh -huh. And I was uh -huh. one of two kids in our ashram group and our age group who yeah. played madunga, you know, so I was, it was, for me, that was like the one thing I had in my life yeah. in the ashram that was like some sort of free yeah. uh, outlet, yeah. like something that I could do that nobody could take away kind of a thing that I, I was allowed somehow to 
yeah. do something in the temple, in the community, making mm. music, show what I can do, <laughs> and and it plays a, actual, an actual real role in people's lives. Right, you right. See, it was just like this Yeah, because Murdunga is in the Kirtan, yeah. so it's got a place. Yeah. yeah. And so it had a really important sort of role in my life. And, and so getting, it was like, wow, this, and so for the second punishment, uh, okay. Chakravarti, the headmaster, took my murdunga away from me and gave it to his son, mm. who happened to mm. like playing murdunga. Mm, so God. then he was very happy and proud to have my murdunga. And boy, you can imagine that steam in me to oh. have to see someone else with my, you know, yeah, I took my murdunga and gave it to him. And, oh you know, so my gosh! Because this murdunga was given by your step, yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's just crushing. And then for the third punishment, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I was to report every day to Shigalim's office. So Shigalim was the previous headmaster, yeah. who was just playing some supportive sort of a role at this point. At okay. this point, and I think supportive that was because, of, because there was years of complaints of sexual abuse to the kids uh -huh. uh, he was beating his wife or i don't know there was all kinds of rumors going around about him and so they right. kind of put just to make people room. stop talking yeah, step yeah, yeah. get him stepped away aside somewhere uh -huh. you know but he was such a scholar and translated the Mahabharata and the ramayan and he was you know just wow such a great brahmin devotee you know so all these material flaws must be overlooked whatever anyhow so he had an office uh, in the front part of our building, which is now where the restaurant part is, that I had to report to every day for a month as part of my, mm. the final part of my punishment. Mm. So I had no, you know, so every day after school, meaning the academic part of our day, we would get back, you know, somewhere around three or whatever it was, and uh, I, would, I had to go to his office every day. And basically he would sit, sit me in a chair uh, which in the very beginning, I remember I was like, oh, wow, I'm going to get, it's like a, one of those, it was the first time I had ever experienced the office chair with a cushion oh, and it could spin. spin. Yeah. Oh, God. So, but yeah, basically he used that spinning and, you know, all that stuff so that oh, he no. could circle around me and constantly talk at me for these sessions every day. Oh, my And gosh. it was basically, he was like, you know, why are you lying about your teacher? Why have you made up these lies? You know you're lying. And do you know if, that if you ever tell anybody these lies that you're telling, you know, you're going to be, you know, put into, you know, the worst punishment that you can ever imagine. You'll never see your parents again, all this kind of threats. And it was just talking from up to down, just like constantly uh -huh. talking at me, these things. And it would just reverberate after days and days of this, you know, it was like a, Oh, like that's a, mental. A, a, yeah, like a dizziness mm. in my mind. And I started to doubt what had happened to me. Did I, did I lie about this? Oh. Did I make this up? Oh my God. Did I, am I, am I lying? Wow. Am I, did I, wow. did I really make all this up just because I am a bad kid and I was just sort of acting out? Mm. Mm. And and after a matter of course, I, for several years, right. completely, for just this whole part of it, it was just blocked out. I could wow. not, like, just access, you it was like access a, it. just a dark blind spot. Wow, they just completely, he completely psychologically manipulated yeah. it. Complete indoctrination. Yeah. yeah. Repeated yeah. psychological. Yeah, until many years later. Uh, when, you know, as an event happened where a lot of my memories resurfaced, this really served, you know, served as a, a huge, you know, memory block. Mm -hmm. Like I literally, because because this memory was attached to, you know, many, you know, Garanga, you know, the Ananta, Jeeva, all of them had done sexual abuse to me. Wow. Along with all the physics. And so it was like attached to all these mm -hmm. you know, much earlier memories even. Mm -hmm. And, and there was so much that was shut off. Mm. I was no longer able to mentally act because I couldn't no. uh, successfully process this. I couldn't, you know, sort of mm. answer 
to that authoritative voice that he was putting in yeah, there. Of yeah. like, you're lying. Why are you lying? You know you're lying. Yeah. Shut up. You know you're lying. Just admit it. You know, and it's all like, like I mean, it was just so forceful and yeah, so yeah. intense and for such prolonged periods of time, oh. again and again, day after day, that I just literally, I just couldn't even access it yeah, anymore. Yeah. It, it, it's just pushed it, pushed it away. Yeah and overlaid it with this assumption that you're lying. But I mean, yeah. the question itself, why are you lying? There's an assumption there that you are. So it there's an implicit it. belief that's being yeah. instilled. And with that force, it's being instilled. I mm. mean, right, as a child, our nervous system is literally smaller. Yeah. The yeah. force that I can hold is literally, if we just take away the external story and you just look at electrically what's going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Like, I can't, you know, process as much energy as that person can. True. And so, and he, the place that he plays in my mind. Yeah. The authority. The, the authority, the source of food, shelter, and safety. And so that amount of energy in that role, putting something in there, literally made it so that I wouldn't even be able to access conscious thought to get into there mm -hmm. it created a, a an impenetrable like you know literally i physically felt it like a, mm. a billowy puffy mm. shell mm. that couldn't be penetrated like a magnetic sort of it was right. literally like a force field and yeah. i couldn't get past wow a whole chapter of my life so that wow. was kids court so that was kids court for you yeah and you know chakravarti Nobody even knows his name. Mm. He's still a fully active ISKCON, you know, Remember, person yeah. who's highly respected as a because he's a Prabhupada disciple, because Prabhupada was the founder, and so his immediate disciples are, all, are, are nowadays yeah. given the highest ranking. Regard, yeah. Yeah. Just because they're in, they they were initiated yeah. by him. And so he right enjoys this type of mm. social standing and you know his high place in the social strata of things. And these are the people that are being celebrated and carried and not, they're not consciously, but this is the unconscious mm, culture. Right, 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 right. So it doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you abuse kids, whip them, sexually abuse them. Literally ran the whole school. Ran the whole it. school that did it. A whole network and of pedoph kids pediophilic court. abuse network it doesn't matter if you've done that but if you have this label attached to you and this yeah. status then you are yeah. regarded as and it doesn't matter that i fine. say these things or that i have this direct experience i'm just fill in the blank well not mon yeah when i'm right i got a chip on my shoulder yeah well first of all not many of you survived right <laughs> And then those who are there, here, stayed, have either gone mad, you know, meaning just psychologically cannot cope, uh, addicted, you know, dysfunctional. Uh, and those that are kind of, you know, in the community are, yeah. Like Some are heav heavily rationalized and capitulated. Yes, and, and they're, they're also the teachers' pets or the rebels, sort of two extremes. You've happen. spoken about yeah, the two kind of responses that yeah. kids have. Yeah. yeah, you rebelled, yeah. and some just kind of capitulated. Yeah, and you know, and there's I'd say there's a third group of you know people who basically built, um, you know, and there's numerous, uh, a lot of us who have built, managed to build a, a life in, okay. the, in the modern world. That's true. Of things. Just completely and disconnected they, they, from yeah, they're just son. completely disconnected from this kind of right, right, right. So literally, the happy are, are these types of people, like the Chakravartis, yeah, and the Sri Williams, and all the GBCs and Temple Presidents, and all these people yeah. who are involved in all this and are still involved in this are aware, haven't happier. Are, how happy are they that these people just go away? Yeah, right. Because you don't want to be drudging up. But those of us who haven't gone away, mm. right, either capitulate and mm. rationalize and eulogize and make excuses for it all, mm. you know, because they're good religious followers or something, or people, right, 
like me who might have something to say about it. Yeah. I mean, this is just all of that in and of itself is just really traumatizing, horrific. It's a miracle that you've actually been able to even sit here and talk about it, right? Um, and later on, we're going to go into how you've healed and, you know, all of your trauma healing journey. Uh, maybe we'll record that another day because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's a whole piece. So just in and of what, what you've just explained and described, that's already too much for a child to go through. Um, but then you had... Right. Mother what happened child, to your dad? Literally just, yeah, electrically, a child's nervous system yeah. doesn't have the Vulnerable. capacity to process that volume or that type yeah. of energy. And mentally, the concepts and the imagery, in other words, right, isn't formed enough to be able to process mm. those kind of ideas. And there's not even language skill no. to articulate those things to other people yeah. or to ourselves. Yeah. So there's really no other recourse but to create yeah. a stasis, yeah. a freeze. Yeah. That, that, so there's high activation because that, that energy has got to go somewhere. Yeah. So now a huge part of us basically is going to be compromised and busied yeah. in a holding pattern. Yeah. And I think this is the thing that people in the ISCON community or any community that has experienced institutional you know, child abuse, the churches, the Scientology, right? The members don't understand this. Yeah. The long lasting impact of that abuse. Yeah. And we're here, we're not talking about just one. Yeah. We're like multiple daily, for years, consistent yeah. for years. It is honestly a miracle that you are here. You still have faith in Krishna. You still, I mean, deep as well. You have your own pra practice, your own spiritual, you know, active life. Um, you still have faith in, faults, you know, some followers like devotees of Krishna and, and, and the path, right? And I mean, you know, we'll yeah. go into your extensive study and yeah. years although, in India. That... I would say that it's quite a bit transformed. Yeah, absolutely. That I, I had been introduced, introduced to. Introduced to, yeah. And I think that's the most impart, important part yeah. of what I have to offer. Right. Because of the filter that um, my response, my successful response to all this has yeah. gifted me with. Yeah. A bullshit filter, if you will, mm. but basically uh, a filter that allows me to see not not just you know what's bad or, or dirty or anything, but what is an actual essential spiritual personal life. Mm. What is religious? What is sentimental? What is just conceptual? What is ritualistic? Mm. Right? All of these things can be interesting, you know, useful ingredients, but mm -hmm. none of them are essentially what all of us seek, whether we even think of ourselves as religious or God-fearing mm -hmm. or not. Right. And all of us have a part of us that seeks for meaning, mm -hmm. that seeks for a personal satisfaction that is deeper than my name is and this is my story mm. or I'm a boy or a girl or I'm American or an Indian or you know whatever yeah. all these external there's a personal meaning and satisfaction mm -hmm. we all seek and that is what my response to this has gifted me with is some perspective and experience with that yeah and so do you think that that following that deeper meaningful purpose that's yeah. what's saved you yeah, that's right. I, I think that any person who has successfully healed, you can call it right. that, or successfully responded to challenges that overwhelmed mm. their very sense of identity or existence in this world, mm. have the only way that that's going to be done is to successfully bring out and respond with and express that personal essential part of us. Mm. Right. So can we 
touch upon your father, your younger brother, mm -hmm. and the healing, your, you know, how you healed your, your, your whole Madanga journey, um, your trauma healing, you know, because I know that there's a story where you remember, right? Mm -hmm. you, some memories get triggered, you go back to New Vrindavan at a later stage, and then there your healing journey began, which I think we'll have to come back to. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, which is a fascinating, you know, part of your whole life. Can we touch upon, I mean, not yeah. touch upon So we can draw your back father. for a moment and sort of look again at the, you can say the larger scope of this story, which essentially spans from the late 70s in New Vrindavan in West Virginia, uh, up through the 90s, essentially, yep. you can say. And uh, for me, the, the largest, you can say, nutshell sort of elements in my particular story were, okay, the physical abuse, the sexual abuse, uh, the murder of my father, the, uh, at the same time, uh, literally at the three months before my father died, my younger brother died in a refrigerator there. Uh, and, and then leaving New Vrindavan and going into public school. These are kind of like, you know, and then mm. on the other side, this strain, this thread of Krishna. Mm. Srila Prabhupada, Krishna. You know, this culture, the, the transcendental, spiritual, religious, whatever, that thread and that element. Mm. And so these are sort of like the, the pieces in the mix mm. in my narrative, in the story that uh, weaves, you know, the infinite things in our, <laughs> all of our life stories together. So uh, I was six years old when my father was murdered. This is 1983 and I was born in 77, mm -hmm. so I was six at the time. And. Three months before my father was murdered, uh, my brother, younger brother, who was uh, at the time just three, four ish, mm -hmm. uh, he passed away. He uh, and another young boy mm. were found in a refrigerator, which was in Ugh. the uh, extended greenhouse area. So the temple building at the time mm. had a greenhouse affixed to the side where the Tulsi plants, right? this is a, the sacred basil plant mm. that is used in a lot of the ceremony and the, and the flower garlands that were used also in the you know, worship mm -hmm. and so on. And there's a refrigerator inside of there where some of the garlands and what, whatever it was that were kept in there. And that, the, these old refrigerators, mm. they would lock. Uh, when, and they passed laws later to not make refrigerators this way because this was not an isolated Case right. That, that you know, kids could be found dead in them. I suppose. Uh, yeah, people get that. trapped in them. I've never actually looked into it, but anyhow, my brother and this young boy were found dead in it. And then a few months later, uh, I'm just going to gloss over. You know, my my father was murdered by two members of the community who had their separate disputes with my father mm. on the order of the guru, who had his dispute with my father. Right. Right. Right, and then. So that's kind of like, a, you know, the major sort of mm -hmm. anchor pieces you can say for mm -hmm. me in mm -hmm. terms of who am I yeah. inside of this community. Right, right. Right. So years later, me dealing with whatever happened with me sort mm -hmm. of had to be understood inside of who I was in the community, in the community. because of these major events. You know, my it was my father that was murdered, mm. and, and what that means about my role here, and, and yeah. so on, as it is different from everyone else who yeah. would have shared everything else. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, how about we do a part two, and then a three, because mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, you know, I obviously yeah. being your wife, <laughs> know the story, mm. but it's there's a lot yeah. in there and then not only just kind of what happened but like you're saying you know what did that then mean for you in the Gurukul and also 
uh, there's details there about your father and, you know, the purpose, right, that he was sort of trying to fulfill. Mm. Anyway, there's a whole right. piece in there. And then, you know, I think maybe yeah. we can come back and, yeah. and do a part two yeah. and, and, and also talk about your healing journey. And, yeah. and that has led you, you know, to being, a, I'm going to say, Madanga Master and and you know healer trauma healer yourself and palmist so it's, there's there's things that link in to that yeah. Yeah. yeah wow how are you doing yeah i'm fine yeah okay good <laughs> well thank you so much you've yeah you've really you've really endured a lot and it's like i said it's a miracle that you know i, I obviously because I'm a therapist, like a therapist, and I specialize in trauma as well, I hear so many clients' horrific stories. And although I, a part of my practice anyway, is having faith in the, you know, human's ability, not even just human, but just, you know, living being, we are a living being, we have a purpose here. Um, and, you know, instilling that in them and holding that hope and holding that belief in them that they can recover from whatever horrific event they've been through I have that anyway but I think your story really does um, make me me believe it even more and then that also comes through in me instilling that faith and holding that belief for my clients who are so you know often feeling suicidal and hopeless because they've experienced a horrific event trauma so i just want to yeah. thank you for yeah you know i don't know just i mean sharing now but also going through what you went through and just keeping the hope so that when people hear hear you hopefully they can feel inspired that they can survive through anything too. Yeah. Well, it's my honor and my, my pleasure to be here. Yeah. And obviously any of us will be very happy and honored at the prospect of contributing something meaningful and valuable to our family, community and society. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>